All right, let's talk about fatigue. Fatigue is one of the most common modes of failure. So what is fatigue? Fatigue is failure due to dynamic or fluctuating stress. So when you hear about cyclic loading, when things are cycling between on and off or under tension and compression, and these things cycle over long periods of time, eventually it can cause it to fail. We, they call it fatigue because fatigue denotes a sort of you get tired over time. You can't withstand this over long periods of time. And that's the same idea here. It fatigues in that it fails after many cycles. Uh, they estimate about 90% of metal failures are fatigue related, right? Uh, the challenge with fatigue is that it happens relatively suddenly without warning. You don't always see the signs because it just looks fine until it snaps all of a sudden. Um, now there's different types of cyclic stresses that can occur. There's generally three models that people talk about. There's reversed stress cycle. Reverse stress cycle means that just means that the mean stress, the average stress, is centered at zero. So this would be an example of that here. Here you see our stress plotted against time, or cycles, right? And it goes from positive stress, that's going to be tension, to negative stress, that's compression. But the average is right here at zero, right? So if I take something and I bend it just a little bit and then I rotate it, you can see at the top of the pencil right here is shown, the letters there, are now under what? They're under tension because I'm bending it. But as I rotate it to the bottom, now those with the letters there, they're now on the bottom, I'm now compressing them. So as you bend it just at a degree and then you rotate it, you're alternating it between tension, compression, tension, compression, right? Now another type of loading would be a repeated stress cycle. Take a look at this one. It's alternating between a large tensile stress and a small tensile stress, large and then small. So at all times it's under tension, but it's varying in its load, okay? And the last one would be random or spectrum loading where it's sort of going up and down, but it's a random pattern, right? So these can be, uh, depending on your application, if you're talking about the fatigue in the axle of your car, then it's going to be uh, probably something like this if it's not just right. Um, whereas if it's, say, day and night cycling from thermal fluctuations, it might be more close to a random loading. In any case, these are uh, fluctuations. So for all of these things, we can define uh, an average. So you're going to add the maximum and the minimum, divide it by two. There's the range, which is the difference between the max and the minimum loading. And then there's the amplitude, which is the, the range uh, divided by two, right? You can take the stress ratio of taking the maximum stress to the, the minimum to the maximum, right? And for all these things, you can generate what are called SN curves. That's stress versus number of cycles, right? So here's what they look like. Here you're plotting the stress amplitude with units of stress, right? In this case, they've got meganewtons per meter squared. And they're plotting that against number of cycles. And for many materials, what we see is the following, that as you cycle things, the number of cycles necessary for it to fail goes down. You see a downward trend for most materials. And you might have seen this before. If you've taken a paper clip, try this at home. Take and bend it. As you bend it, you'll notice that it will last a number of times and then it's going to break. Here's a piece of pop can from earlier. If I take this thing and I fold it once, it doesn't break. Right? I can fold this uh, quite nicely and it's not breaking. But if I unfold it and I go the other direction, and then I go back, and I do this a few times, what we're going to notice is that it will eventually, see it breaking there? See that crack forming? And then it breaks. Right? So aluminum is particularly susceptible to fatigue. It just gets weaker and weaker and weaker. The more you flex it and bend it uh, cyclically, it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Now, some materials exhibit a really cool property. They get weaker to a point, a limit, and then they stop getting weaker. They exhibit what's called a fatigue limit. In this case, 1045 steel has a fatigue limit of around 300 meganewtons per meter squared. It doesn't get weaker than that right? Which is really awesome if you're designing for something that needs to last millions of cycles, right? Because it gets weaker up until about 1 million cycles, 10 to the 6 cycles. And then after that, it has sort of a, a minimum strength that you can count on it sort of maintaining. Um, that's really valuable for long-term applications. It gives you something to design around. The aluminum, you have to just think about, okay, this has to last 10 million cycles. Uh, that means I can't design it to ever see a stress amplitude greater than this, you know, 150 or whatever, okay? Um, so many steels do have a fatigue limit, somewhere around a third to two-thirds of whatever their tensile strength is, uh, not cycled, right? 
Um, most non-ferrous materials uh, have no fatigue limit, most. Fatigue stress is the stress of failure after some given number of cycles, and fatigue life is the number of cycles until failure occurs at some given stress, okay? So that's how we define these terms. Now, question I have is, what do we do for variability, right? Don't samples vary? Some of them, uh, even if they're all the same type of material, if you get 20 samples, some will break at slightly higher loads and some at slightly lower loads. How do we account for that in these S versus N curves, right? Here's what we would do. When you get the data for these, here you're plotting the stress amplitude, S versus N. What they'll often show is just the curve. Let's say your material looks like this, right? But that's if you averaged all of your samples, right? So this is the maybe the 50% failure rate. On average, that's how your materials behave. But it would be equally, maybe even more useful to show a curve right here, which represents when 10% of your samples will fail. And then show another curve where maybe 90% of your samples fail, right? So adding these lines that take into account the probability of failure is much more useful than a single average value. We're going to talk about variability in data a little bit later when we talk about Weibull statistics, but it's a really useful tool for thinking about materials as they actually are, which is not homogeneous. There's variability, and this helps take into account for it. Right now, when we find uh, when we do this testing, you know, cyclic testing, we're bending it back and forth. We find that some materials have a real temperature dependence or a frequency dependence, and others don't. So why might that be the case? For example, polymers tend to have a really strong t frequency dependence. If you cycle them really fast, they're weaker than if you cycle them slowly. So what happens is, remember, polymers have a low melting point, right? The melting point of polymers is much lower than something like a ceramic. And as you bend these things and cycle them, right, loading and unloading them, you're generating a little bit of heat. And so if you're doing this really quickly, you're generating a lot of heat. And so you can actually heat these things up and so the chains become more mobile and then they start deforming and eventually you get crack formation. So that's why you get uh, temperature dependence more severely in polymers and then in metals and finally in ceramics, okay? Now, fatigue is, uh, is a form of failure, and so since it's failure, it has to have both crack initiation and crack propagation. So the total number of cycles until it fails, we'll call that NF, right, the number of cycles to failure, is going to be equal to those steps involved in initiating the crack plus those involved in propagating the crack, okay? Now, uh, cracks start at a slip system. We'll talk what about a slip system is in a few chapters. Um, and then they continue to grow. The crack growth rate accelerates. The bigger the crack is, the faster it grows. Um, okay, And as it grows over time, especially if you have a scenario where it's going from tension to compression, what you'll see is this. So here's our crack, right? Uh, as you start to pull on it, right, so B here, you're expanding it. So the crack is getting larger, so it's being torn a little bit that way. And then it stops being loaded, so it's static. And then you compress it again, so these get squeezed back down, and now you've incrementally moved your crack over. So these lines, these rep, these lines represent each cycle. Each cycle, it pushes a little bit forward and then it squishes again. Pushes a little bit forward and squishes. So we call these benchmarks. Sometimes they're called striations or clamshell patterns. Right? You can see these see these stripes in that material. Each one of those represents a cycle of fatigue, and so. What's really interesting is that you can see the origin of fracture, where the, the crack uh, began, some sort of origin, and then you'll see these clamshell markings, and you could count them up, and you could count the number of cycles until failure occurred. So we saw something kind of like this in the beginning of this chapter when we talked about the C uh, hooks. Uh, when we looked at it, you can see a series of sort of almost like tree rings. Now, this probably wasn't a traditional fatigue. This was probably wear, right? That thing was hanging on this hook, and then as wind you know, blows the, the lines a little bit, they're moving just a little bit, and so it's slowly sawing it. Uh, but nevertheless, if you were to count all those things, you could zoom in enough and actually see them, you could get an idea of how long this was going on for, right? So that would be an example of, uh, of a type of fatigue.